to first thank you um, to Javier, the uh, professors, for inviting me here to, to Spain. It's really um, wonderful to be here and a wonderful honor to speak here at, the, um, at this institute. Um, what I'd like to, to do today is to present to you the, um, actually, I'll divide my, my presentation actually into three different parts. I'll present the, the Jewish political tradition project um, and the handout that I asked to prepare has the table of contents of the, entire, of the four volumes so you can get a sense of what the scope of the project uh, is. We published two of the volumes and we are hopefully in the next couple of months we'll submit the third volume to, to Yale University Press. Um, I want to speak beside that on what makes such a project possible. What kind of conceptualization of the tradition is necessary in order to undertake such a project? And on the other hand, if I have time, I'll speak in a third, uh, 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 add on a third part in what seem to me um, major themes that arise um, from the first volume which deals with authority. And I'll, I'll explain the logic behind the structuring of the entire project. Now, I'll say ahead of time, um, if anyone wants to ask me a question while I'm speaking, feel absolutely free. I, I, I'm completely comfortable with that. And if we can make it more like a seminar and less like a lecture, um, uh, I think we'll enjoy it more. Okay. Um, now, the, uh, let's begin with understanding how to go about conceptualizing the Jewish political tradition. Because one can ask, is there such a thing as a Jewish political tradition? First of all, if we focus on the word politics. Why? Because if we identify politics or the political, first and foremost, with sovereign politics, then um, roughly from the year 70 of the Common Era, uh, the end of the, the failed Great Rebellion against Rome in Judea, or if you want to push it a bit forward to the year 135, the failure of the Bar Kokhba Rebellion against Rome, Somewhere from there until, let's say, 1898, which is the first Zionist um, Congress, one can argue that there is no real Jewish politics in that sense. These are people in exile. And in what sense can a people who understand themselves as being in exile, in what sense can we speak about a political tradition? Indeed, if you look at Zionist ideology, Zionist ideology was that you could put those 2,000 years in brackets because nothing important politically happened. Um, and sovereign politics is, is, is really what politics about, is about. And therefore, the attempt to create a modern Jewish nation state is is Jewish politics, but not anything that happened beforehand. This was classic Zionist ideology. So one, one question is, in what sense can we speak about a Jewish political tradition if we're speaking about a, uh, a people in exile? What kind of political wisdom can we speak about uh, under such a condition? Um, certainly with regard to um, what is crucial, if we think about European history, um, we're speaking from late antiquity through the medieval and really into, um, into modernism in its, in its most classical sense, we don't really have um, a, any full-blown Jewish political uh, existence and institutions. And this is one question we can ask ourselves. A second question, goes to 
uh, ask the question of whether there is such a thing as Jewish politics from, from a deeper conception, from a deeper concern, and this has to do with what we might call a, a theological political interest. If one views or thinks about God as king, thinks about the Jewish religion in theocratic terms, then one can ask, in what sense can there be a Jewish politics at all, uh, given the fact that Judaism as a religion seems to be committed to some form of theocratic vision. Um, one can turn, for example, to such modern writers, think about John Locke in the letter concerning toleration. Locke argues that two groups cannot be given um, civic status, Catholics and Jews, and basically for the same reason, because they have split political loyalties. Catholics are committed to Rome, and Jews have a theocratic vision of their religion, and therefore they have a politicized concept of religion, but are incapable of being citizens. This is Locke's argument in the letter concerning toleration at the end of the 17th century, beginning of the 18th century. The letter undergoes many changes a long time. Um, this is not an argument that he invented. He took it from Spinoza's theological political treatise, who argued very much the same um, some decades earlier uh, in, in his major published book, because the, the ethics wasn't published in Spinoza's lifetimes, but, but, but the uh, theological political treaty, treatise was. And this is Spinoza. Spinoza argues that Judaism is a theocracy there. And uh, in many ways, um, Locke picks this up. In fact, Hobbes doesn't use the term theocracy, but in Leviathan, pretty much picks this up, um, um, agrees with this. Where this argument comes from, I'll speak about a bit later. But this is a deeper argument. This is an argument not about history and historical experience. It's one that has to do with the very foundations of legitimacy of politics, in the sense that from a theological political point of view, in the classic sense of, of a political theology, not in the later sense that we will find in Karl Schmitt, although I'll, I'll return to that, but in the classic sense, one can say that, that there really is no room for politics as an expression of human agency in a tradition that's theocratically committed. So this is the second question, okay? So one question was, comes from Jewish political history. Second question comes from the very foundations of Judaism as a religion, which seems to undermine the possibility of speaking of a Jewish political tradition. So we questioned the notion of politics, we questioned the notion of Jewish politics. And thirdly, I want to question the notion of a Jewish political tradition. In, in what sense can we speak of a tradition of Jewish political thinking? Why? Let's think for a moment of how we would identify, in terms of genre, what political thought is in the Western tradition. So, we would go to, first of all, to Plato's Politea. That's the first place we would go to. We would go to the Politea, we would go to the laws, and we would, we see a work that's concerned with the question of what is a polis and how should it be ruled. Those are the questions. An interesting question is what we think about Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War. Okay, let's put that aside for a moment and bracket the question of whether that is a form of political philosophy or not. 
uh, I think it is and I think it should be, but for our sake, now let's bracket that question. We'll continue to Aristotle's politics. It assumes the same assumptions in terms of what is politics, or what is the political, as Plato. If we continue to Augustine's City of God, we see these assumptions reworked into the Republican Roman tradition and a reflection on what this might mean for Christianity in the making. Uh, if we turn to a thinker like Marcellus of Padua, but let's think in the Arabic tradition. Think about Al-Farabi's great, great political works the commentaries on Plato's works, the, uh, uh, um, um, the book on, on the beliefs of, um, of, um, of the people of the virtuous city. Think of Ibn Rushd's commentary on the Republic. These are works written in clearly people who understand what they are doing as political philosophy and writing with regard to the classics of Hellenistic political philosophy. If we turn to modernity, let's take the Renaissance. If we look, for example, at a slightly different genre, play at uh, Machiavelli's Prince. Well, Machiavelli's Prince um, is rooted in an entire mirror of Prince's literature, which actually go back in many ways to think about Al-Farabi's Fusul uh, al-Madani, the aphorisms of the statesman as it's, as it's translated to English. We certainly have a long tradition here, a um, very interesting one. Move on to, for example, Hobbes's Leviathan, even Spinoza's, let's put aside for a moment Spinoza's the theological political treatise, I'll return to that. I mentioned Locke, Montesquieu, Rousseau, we look at this entire tradition, we know the political treaties is an established form, is, is an established generic form in Western writing that has its roots deep in Hellenistic and Roman writing, in the Arabic tradition, in the Christian tradition. We can see how all this goes to formulate anyone who, is, who listens to this entire history can see how it, how indeed there is a tradition of Western political thinking, and a deep one, one that goes many, undergoes many changes, but there's cer it's certainly there. When we turn to the Jewish tradition and ask ourselves whether the political treatise is there as a genre, we find it, but we find a very small amount. Let's take first of all the classic example. Well. One questionable one is Spinoza's theological political treatise. Should we think of this at all as a Jewish work or not? It's certainly written by a Jew. And certainly written by a Jew who never renounced his Judaism. Spinoza didn't become a Christian. In fact, if I understand the theological political treatise correctly, I think that the theological political treatise has two agendas in it. One agenda is to ask how to strengthen the republican character of the Low Countries, especially of Amsterdam. This is a major interest. Secondly, what kind of political theology now, much more in a Schmittian sense, would serve Amsterdam well? What kind of political theology would serve Amsterdam if the Calvinists rule Amsterdam? And finally, what place can Jews have in a free Amsterdam? All these questions are questions that really are bothering him, including what civic status in a Republican enables Jews. In many ways, Spinoza, in that way, is perhaps one of the first modern Jews, if not the first of modern Jews. 
um, that envisages a secular Jewish existence as a citizen. Um, should we read the theological political treaties also as a Jewish work? This is an interesting question. And one I think that is best left open rather than closed right now, because I think it, I think leaving that question open it, it encourages us to read it as a complex work, uh, to take many things into account in it, because it's no less Christian than it is Jewish, which is also what's interesting about it. But um, if we can raise that kind of question, we certainly can't raise that question about Moses Mendelssohn's Jerusalem. Moses Mendelssohn's Jerusalem is definitely a theological, political treatise updated and arguing against Locke and against Hobbes. He's making a strong argument for equal civil rights for Jews. But also includes an interpretation of Judaism that would enable such a, um, um, a entrance of Jews on their own part into the modern state. Because leaving the ghetto needs two partners. It needs a host society that is willing to let Jews out of their ghetto, and it needs the will of the Jews to, live, to leave the ghetto. And these two issues are crucial for understanding um, Jewish politics and modernity. They, they, uh, they completely color Jewish politics in, in modernity, both the relation of non-Jewish states to their Jewish citizens, secondly, how Jews understand their own place within these societies. So Mendelssohn's treaty certainly is something like that. Another book we might mention is Josephus, writing in the first century. Josephus is War of the Jews, uh, which is his history of the rebellion of uh, Judea against, um, against Rome is definitely a political history, but much closer to Thucydides and to the great Roman historians than to the political treaties that to Plato's Republic. But one of the reasons I, re I left the question of Thucydides open is because if you read both Hobbes and Spinoza closely, you can see how deeply they are formed, not only by the political treaties, but the works of political history of, classi of classicism, including that of Josephus. So um, these are certainly works we can point to. But if you look at the Jewish tradition of writing, of writing theology, reflective theology, of writing reflective philosophy, of Kabbalah, of Halakha, of Jewish law. This is like, these works are like a drop in the sea. Um, when you look at, 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 at the wealth of literature, the, po the political treaties certainly did not carry great weight in this tradition although they are very important writings and have a tremendous impact on Jewish self-understanding, no doubt. Where you can see a lot of reflection on political life is actually in probably the main genre of Jewish writing, which is the commentary. It's in the commentary that you find the wealth very much as is true about classical Christian and Arab writing uh, and Muslim writing. Of course you have the writing of the philosophers, of the falasafa in the, in the Arabic tradition, but think about the importance of the, of the Koran or the Hadith in Arabic writing, in Muslim, in Muslim writing in terms of understanding what a political and theological political mindset is for a Muslim. Um, 
These are crucial. And of course, all this throws us back to the Bible. How should we read the Bible? And now when I'm speaking, I'm speaking about the Hebrew Bible from the eyes of a Jew. That is to say, that does not include the New Testament in it, but thinks only from the point of view of the Hebrew Bible. What is this great epic work? How should we read it? What kind of work is it? What is it? Should it be read as a political work or also as a political work? How do we think about it? Before answering these questions, what I want to point to is the essential point is that it's by no means self-evident that there is such a thing as a literary tradition of Jewish writing on politics. It seems to be marginal relative to what I pointed at as the longer Western tradition and the wealth of writing in the Western tradition. So we have three major questions. And the questions I posed in terms of the title of this work that we did, The Jewish Political Tradition, asking whether there is such a thing as Jewish politics and the Jewish political tradition. These are the big questions. And indeed, there are those that argue that there is no such thing as a Jewish political tradition. This has been argued in many different ways. First of all, there's a very important Christian tradition that argues this. Um, the classic pre-modern in the Catholic world, you might even say pre-Vatican II, conception of Judaism is that Judaism is essentially, and Jewish exilic life is a testimony to the historical calling of the church. In that respect, there is no such thing as a Jewish political tradition. When you look at strong secular voices within the Jewish tradition in modernity, within Judaism in modernity, they would make the same argument. Uh, indeed, um, there's a classic work called Jewish Theocracy by Gershon Weiler the late Gershon Wallach, who was a professor in Tel Aviv, he actually, um, although I completely disagree with his own conception of, uh, of Jewish theocracy, he was actually, when I gave my job talk at Tel Aviv University 20 years ago, he was the chair. And he graciously um, 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 introduced me, even though I, I argued against his basic thesis that there is no such thing as, uh, as, uh, uh, as a Jewish political tradition because one should view Judaism as theocracy. For him, this was a secular argument. Why? Because it was an argument that, that came from the point of view of interpreting Jewish in national cultural terms rather than in religious terms, which is indeed the deep assumption of, what, of Israel, of the modern state of Israel, as a Jewish nation state. That's the way it understands itself. Now, what I will try to convince you today is that these positions are wrong that there is indeed a Jewish political tradition, that these three arguments that seem very strong ones are, upon further inspection, uh, less powerful than they might seem. And in many ways, the entire project of the Jewish political tradition was an attempt to portray an alternative way of thinking. Okay, so that's where I'm going. Any questions up to this point? 
Anything you want me to clarify up to this point? If not, I'll take a step forward. So let's begin with the question, with, with the first point, that a people in exile cannot have a political wisdom in a serious sense. The first problem is here the assumption that one identifies politics with sovereign politics. Now this is a point, this is a weakness that I think over the past 20 years we've learned to look at uh, more carefully, especially because of the work of political theorists of my generation. If I look at the, uh, at the, the uh, at, if you look at, at work in, in political philosophy in the 20th century, so after, you look at after World War II, and I'm speaking about the Anglo-American world and those parts of Europe that I know best. In the Anglo-American world, after World War II, the questions of political philosophy were basically turned around the argument between Marxism versus liberalism. And you see that the works of people like Isaiah Berlin, Hannah Arendt, Jacob Talmon, all were around those themes. That was the thematics. The big change in political philosophy came in, in the United States and Britain when John Rawls published Theory of Justice in the early 1970s. It suddenly changed everyone's focus because the Cold War was already, had petered out in many ways. Marxism wasn't Marxism, liberalism wasn't liberalism anymore in its own way. But we're really speaking at the high moment of the um, high moment of social democracy in many, in many, many countries. And theory, theory of justice is, is really the great, one of the great articulations of what a, um, of what redistributive justice might mean. And this created an entire generation of thinking because of, 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 of the stature and the grandeur of the, of the enterprise and, and everything, the whole reaction to it. I came to study in the Hebrew University in 1980 when I was discharged from the army. And I think about the books that were published in 1980 in the Anglo-American world. My teacher, Michael Wolzer, published Spheres of Justice. Bob Nozick published Anarchy, State, and Utopia. Actually, these two works both grew out of the seminar. They both taught together at Harvard, where they taught theory of justice and their critique of it. Um, Rorty publishes Philosophy in the Mirror of Nature. Alistair McIntyre published um, um, After Virtue. Coming as a student in 1980 to study philosophy was a great moment. It was a moment that there was like, like fear of justice had created a tidal wave. And we were all riding on it because these were the great works. And if you think about it, at the same time, Habermas is publishing his work. So it's, the resonance was so powerful and, and, and um, in America, of course, this comes hand in hand in America and Britain with the really the the first um, I would say um, deep internalization of Wittgenstein. This is crucial in America um, and in Britain. This 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 also colored everything. Um, much more of Heidegger was internalized than people were willing to say. But when you look back, you see that Heidegger was there also. But this is, this is the great moment. But what happens later in the 90s is, 
I would say, if John Rawls is the, is the high moment of modernism in political thinking, um, from the 90s on, uh, the, great, the greater awareness that we are in a postmodern state becomes acutely present for many, many people doing political philosophy, especially, I would say, people who are my age, who are beginning to understand the importance of the work of Derrida, of Levinas, um, and therefore, for our generation, the critique of sovereignty is already a crucial element in our political reflection. I'll tell you that from my, from my own sense, I, uh, uh, I translated and edited Hobbes' Leviathan into Hebrew. Um, and one of the reasons was because the need to rethink the question of the political because of, of the deep questions concerning the viability of the modern sovereign state. So for us now looking back from 2013, looking, looking at these questions, the question of identifying politics with sovereign politics is already attenuated. We know that politics is much more complex. Not only because, and I actually reject a post-structuralist identification of politics with all power relations. I think that's a reductionist position. I think that's wrong. Um, it's a wrong approach, I would argue, philosophically. Not because I think it's incoherent. I think because I would argue against it politically. I, I would prefer leaving the concept of politics for, for the, particularly for the question of how we, we organize our life together. Um, I, would, I would prefer leaving that, but, but I I right away admit that this is a first-order philosophical position, and by no means self-evident. It's one that one has to make a strong argument for. Um, but my own position in that respect is certainly not post-structuralist, um, um, but I am, uh, I would say, acutely aware of the questions of how tenable the modern state is in postmodern conditions. I think these are crucial questions. Why is this important? It's important because it enables us to look at, at politics in a much more flexible way. The question of how an exilic community organizes its life vis-a-vis -vis a hegemonic religion and culture of which it's not a part of is a crucial political question. In fact, what we might say is that Leftist politics in Europe and in the United States turned from a politics that's interested in social democracy to a politics that's interested in questions of hegemony and cultural hegemony and the prices of cultural hegemony. In this respect, when you look at it this way, Jews did not have the experience of running a sovereign state but they definitely had a major experience in thinking of how a diasporic people might survive. And I think that this is a crucial point because really the question of political experience is premised on ideological assumptions that are very problematic. I mentioned before that the Zionist ideology argued that exilic Jewish existence is not political because the Zionist project was essentially modern and modernistic. It was a project of creating a Jewish nation state. It conceived itself completely within modernist terms. Now Zionism is a very complex movement because on the one hand Zionism, what did the Zionists argue? I'm talking about 19th century now, Zionist ideology, as a movement of Jewish revival, cultural revival. They 
argued on the one hand that in the Euro Europe of nation states, there will be no future for the Jews. And here they were completely right with hindsight. They were right. In modern Europe, there was no more place for Jews. Beginning, one might say, with the first European nation state, Spain, and ending with Germany. From the expulsion of the Jews in 1492 to the uh, um, destruction of the Jews of Central Europe in during the war, one can see this as one in one sense, with all the differences between them, and I by no means think they're the same thing. But I do think that it has to do with a major question of what kind of place might Jews have within a nation state. This is a crucial issue. And here, they were completely realists. On the other hand, they were completely utopian. Their solution? To immigrate to Palestine and create a Jewish nation state there. Now, here you see the deep problems of Jewish modern thinking that is completely realist and completely utopian at one at the same moment. And if you don't understand this mixture, you can't understand what, what Zionism is and you can't understand its discourse, including to this very day when you hear a speech like the Prime Minister Netanyahu gave at the UN. It's completely colored by the two, at the same, at, at one at the same moment. Now, there is one more ideology that thinks that there is no significant Jewish political existence in this hiatus between the year 70 or 134 and the year 1898, and that is ultra-Orthodoxy, Jewish ultra-Orthodoxy. The Jewish ultra-Orthodoxy argues that Jewish existence in exile is miraculous. It's a miracle. It's God, it's divine providence. And therefore, there is no Jewish political history. So really, they're in, in, in a very interesting way, Zionism and ultra-Orthodoxy, that is, secular nationalism and religious ultra-Orthodoxy support each other ideologically by arguing that there is no such thing as a Jewish political tradition. However, what's the weakness of this argument? The weakness of this argument, you can say, let's go in realist terms. Let's turn to Machiavelli. If you think about what every good prince wants to do, what does he want to do? At the minimum, he wants to survive. Now, if you take survival as your canon, then the Jews are damn good at it. They know how to survive. They've been doing this for a long time, and keeping a culture that has uh, self-awareness of itself as a continuous culture. However many different Judaisms we might have, there is an ongoing consciousness of a shared culture. In this respect, the Jews have survived. We have to ask ourselves, if we want to do Jewish political history, what enables Jews to survive? And anyone doing political history has to ask itself that question from a political point of view. What kind of structures made Jewish existence possible? I would argue, without going this into depth, and I'll say more about this hopefully tomorrow evening at the Casa Sfahad, is that here, is the importance of the Jewish kehillah, the community, and the community structure. This is a political structure of people in exile. How it works, why it works, how it's structured institutionally, these are crucial questions. I will not go into them now. I just put this forward as a thesis. And therefore, I would argue that indeed there is much wisdom and much experience that goes into this question of survival, including 
serious prices. Because besides survival, there are other very important political uh, virtues. Justice is the first virtue of political institutions, as John Rawls beautifully put it. There are other political virtues besides survival, and they have to be thought about. So there are prices for this. But I think I've said enough in order to convince you that there is such a thing as Jewish political history. It's complex. This tradition of thought has lived in many, many different kinds of political structures. Monarchy, communities, nation state, everything. We've done a bit of everything. And when you look at it this way, suddenly, oh, there's a much longer history here that has to be considered. One point. Second point has to do with theocracy. Here, I think that when you look carefully at the Bible, first of all, well, the classic arguments for theocracy are in the Bible. Think of Gideon in the book of Judges, when the people turn to him and say to him, rule over us, you, your son, and your son's son. Gideon answers, I will not rule over you, neither will my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. This is a classic statement of theocracy. But if you start looking a bit closer, even at the book of Judges, from which this citation was taken, the book of Judges reiterates three times a very important adage that I, maybe some of you will remember. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Each person did what was right in his own eyes. This is the staunchest critique of theocracy in the biblical tradition. Theocracy means anarchy. And therefore the Bible opts for monarchy. And monarchy is the main institution of government in the Bible. Indeed, if we take, if we look at, at the length of Jewish history, you might say that monarchy over hundreds of years is probably the beside after the Jewish community, the next longest form of institution that Jews espoused as, as, as an institution of rule. Um, I won't go now into details about the book I wrote, which is called Politics and the Limits of Law, Secularizing the Political in Medieval Jewish Thought. Um, one of my main arguments is that, in fact, when you look carefully at, at the rabbinic understanding of politics, you see that the rabbis understand that halakha, Jewish law, is not equipped to rule politically. It's in fact some kind of a counterbalance to political rule. Um, again, I can't go into this in detail, but I think that these points are prima facie enough to point that uh, although the theocratic moment is a very powerful one in Jewish political imagination, when you actually look at the history of institutions and the history of the texts, it doesn't carry any real weight in ruling. The third point has to do with genres. So I already mentioned the marginal genre. But I think that if you look carefully at the tradition of Jewish writing in its entire robustness, you suddenly see that 
the political has a much greater place than what you might think, given the relative marginality of official political treatises. But how can I prove this? In order to prove this, and in order to give us a better tool, what we did was 20 years ago, over 20 years ago, Michael Wolzer, my teacher, and I, is that we asked ourselves, how, if we approach the entire Jewish tradition of writing, what kind, from the point of view of a political theorist, and the questions that interest the political theorists, what would we find? And what we found is enough for, at least for four volumes that we have to fill, but much more even. And let me show you what happened. What happened was that um, we decided to look at the tradition from this point of view and go through it. Throughout the ages. But for this we needed a functional notion of tradition. Because you have to decide what's in and what's out. What do you look at? What don't you look at? For example, is Marx a Jewish political thinker? Is Freud? Is Spinoza? What about St. Paul in Romans? Is he writing as a Jew or is he writing as a Christian? It's clear that Romans is the foundational document of, of the Christian religion. But how does Paul understand himself? Is Paul a Jew? He certainly is. Is he writing as a Jew? These are serious questions. Is Herzl in his Jewish state, is he a Jewish political thinker? He's completely secular. He doesn't know anything about traditional Judaism. He's a completely assimilated Jew. These are serious questions. Because any work like this is an effect. Because no one has ever done something like this. It's an effect, an exercise in canonization. From the point of view of politics. Who's in and who's out? Now, well, you can take uh, Groucho Marx's famous line, I don't want to be a part of any, <laughs> of any club that will take me as a member. <laughs> if we did that, we wouldn't have a book. But we maybe have many Groucho Marxes in here. That, that I grant you. Now, this is, these are the kind of questions we ask ourselves. And here's the, my point about tradition. Our concept of tradition is people who think it's important enough to argue with and against texts that were written before them. This is our criteria of tradition. It's a functional criteria. People who see themselves within a tradition of argumentation. So it's not a tradition of positions. It's a tradition of argumentation. It's a, a tradition of discourse in its verbal sense, not in its noun or adjectival sense. Right? We're engaged in argumentation. That's why Spinoza is part of our work, but Marx isn't. Because Marx is not interested in arguing that. For Marx, Hegel is his tradition. So that, that would give us a kind of notion of boundaries. What did we come up with? Now I invite you to look at, at, what, I, at what I gave you. Look at, look at the titles of the four volumes. How did we approach it? Volume one, you can see, is authority. I'll skip before going into detail. You have on page 11, in Roman numerals, you have the, the table of contents for the four volumes, right? It looks like this, right? This page. Okay. So, volume one is authority, volume two, membership, volume three, community, 
and Volume 4, Politics and History. Let me now explain the rationale. Volume 1 begins with authority, the question, who rules? And what is the justification for ruling others? On the assumption that a quintessential political activity is ruling. And indeed, it has to do with the uniqueness of the political as a sphere of human activity. Because Michael Wolzer in, 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 um, in Spheres of Justice, his wonderful book, begins the book with, with a wonderful parable. He says, anyone who has been involved in political activism knows that when you put together a group, of political activists. There's the person who's good at the computer. There's the person who's excellent at making the phone calls. There's the one who knows how to bring everyone out to the street. There's the one who knows how to best give speeches. How do you organize them as a group? Who makes the decisions? How do you make the decisions? Any political activity begins with the question of ruling. How to make the decisions. How do you go about making the decisions? So we began with the questions of ruling. Who rules and by what, by what right? What arguments are made for ruling? The second question we asked ourselves is the question of membership. And again, I'll make a, a recourse to spheres of justice because I think Michael beautifully put it there that membership is the first good a society distributes. Membership is the first good a society distributes. If politics is the sphere of all the spheres of human engagement because it includes the totality of our agency. <laughs> Membership <coughs> is the first question of entitlement. And the questions of membership are very complex ones. Of who's in and who's out, and I'll touch upon that in a moment. The third question we asked is that of organizing our life together. And here we take a strong position with regard to the question of community. And the question of community is premised upon the centrality of communal existence to Jewish experience. And seeing the community as much more foundational and central to Jewish political history and historical experience than any other form of political organization. And the arena, the institutional arena, where Jews develop their own reflections on the political more than any other. Here we have the most robust uh, discussions that we can find in this tradition. Hence the centrality of community. However, a community and certainly a state, operate within the time framework of history. And hence the fourth part, politics and history. I, uh, the three of us that are the editors, Michael Walzer, Noam Zog, and myself, on all questions in which we, we had many arguments in doing this work. And we usually, try to convince each other. When that didn't work, we took a vote. I was outvoted on the question of the fourth volume that I wanted to call it sovereignty. But they were against it. In many ways, for the reasons I argued beforehand regarding postmodern, the postmodern human political situation. But not only. We ended up calling it politics and history. And here, I think, 
you see the kind of concerns with which we came to, to this material. And now, it broke down into chapter heads. But let me explain to you how that happened. Because when I came to Princeton, in, tell me when to stop. Whenever you want me to stop, whenever you have questions, do it. Because I'll stop at that moment. I have a lot to tell and a tale to tell. But uh, when I came to Princeton in 1989, Michael had written down a list of chapters that in many ways included the kind of questions that I'm asking. And the first thing I did when I came was I spent two months creating a bibliography. Some scores of pages of anything I could think of in this tradition from the Bible, through the Talmud, through the medieval commentary and response to tradition, to modern writing, anything I can imagine and think about that might be relevant. So I created a 30-page list. What did, what did I discover when, when I did this? Is that the grid that we had built didn't fit this tradition in many ways. The tradition wasn't willing to put itself into the grid that I had structured or that Michael had structured. In some senses, it was. But in others, it said, you're asking the wrong questions, because we don't put the question that way in this tradition. So the very process of forming, selecting the material, was one in which we had to learn the difference between our perspective and the perspective of millennia of writers that had different perspectives on what the political means than we did. That we had certain concerns, but they had their concerns. And we had to learn to respect their concerns in doing this kind of work. So this in itself was, a, was an amazing hermeneutical experience of, um, of what Gadamil calls merging horizons. The merging horizons here was between our horizons as modernist writers and the horizons of pre-modern writers, which were completely different. And I think we both learned from it. We learned from it certainly as moderns. But I think their voices can be seen in new perspectives now that perhaps they never envisaged. And that way they learned something also. Not they themselves, but their voices can be heard differently. Um, and then that created the list of chapters. If we turn to authority, for example, or let me give you membership as an example, and then because I don't know if we'll have enough time for everything, so I'll give you membership as an example. First of all, as you can see, we made membership volume two because we thought we should begin with ruling, and we thought of membership in terms of distributive justice. A major critique we had from the right was that this is the wrong order, that membership comes first and ruling second. Now, if you think about it from a nationalist position, that makes a lot of sense. Because the nationalist position sees sovereign politics as an expression of a pre-existing nation that is the bearer of the rights. On that conception, Membership should come first. We, however, really came with a conception that, that, or that thinks of membership in terms of distributive justice rather than in nationalist terms, and we did it the other way around. So this was an interesting argument, for example. Now, one of the things I discovered was that Jews over the ages spent tremendous amount of time and energy thinking about membership, disproportionate to almost any other questions. And I asked myself why. Suddenly I realized that for an exilic community, communities who are not in exile, who have never even thought about the possibility of exile, who do not understand what a diaspora even means, 
because it's not their experience. Their experience of boundaries is often territorial. You live in a region. You don't need a strong concept of territory as you have in modern status thinking. It's enough to think about a region. A, a Basque is a Basque. A, a Breton lives in Breton. Um, a Pole lives in Poland. Um, a Ukraine, um, a, a, a Ukraine peasant living in Greater Poland still identifies himself as Ukraine because he lives in the Ukraine. A community that doesn't live in a region has very different notions of membership, of boundaries. Membership is its boundary. And that's why Jews were obsessed by questions of membership. Certainly, from their exile on, this is a problem that is deeply perturbing to them. When we looked at the structure of membership, we realized, for example, if you look at, at membership, this is actually structured in many ways as a crystal. This is a three-dimensional uh, structure. First of all, we thought about how Jews understood themselves. They understood themselves as having a unique identity. This is conceptualized in this tradition through the concept of election. Who is the significant other of the Jew? Necessary, the Gentile. So here you have the first chapter you'll see is chapter 11, election. Chapter 16, the last one is a Gentile, and that is a mirror image. That's a mirror image. And no one deconstructs it better than St. Paul in, the Roman, in Romans. He's the master. And the first model of how to go about doing this. And the one that in many ways, within the Jewish tradition, I would say is the nightmare in many ways. Then you can look upon membership in a different sense. You can look in the question of who's up and who's down. That's what we call social hierarchy and gender hierarchy. Two different ways of creating hierarchy within a tradition. But this question is different from the question of who's in and who's out. Can you join, which we looked at through the perspective of can you join and can you leave. So suddenly you see we've got hierarchy, we've got joining and leaving, we've got Jew and Gentile. These are three different dimensions, and membership is conceptualized here as a crystal, as being three-dimensional, all with ups and downs, and bipolar, with all the complexities of this, and the inner workings. That's, for example, the structure of Volume 2. Very different from the structure of Volume 1. Volume 1 is really at its heart looking at institutions of authority. Because ruling often works itself out in terms of institutions. Now, I think I'll pause here. I have much more to say. But I really want to give you time to ask me questions because I can continue in detail about all of this. But let me stop now because, um, uh, and, and you tell me if there's what you want me to continue in, if you have questions, anything, anything, everything. I, I want to give us time also to speak, to talk to you. You have very good manners and no one bothered, no one stopped me in the middle, so I have to go. I have a question. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we open the floor now. Okay. What's your name? Just questions. tell me. Oh, my name is Sonia Sanchez and I work in Casa Sacra of Israel. I'm a polygraph. Ah. She studied political science. So. <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't tell that. 
Uh, I have a question. I don't know uh, your work and your book. I'm, I'm sorry, but this is a good opportunity to know it. Yes, uh, regarding volume four, because you have talked about this uh, possibility of establishing um, a Jewish political tradition based on those uh, this, uh, four um, uh, perspectives, authority, membership, etc. But in volume four, there is one aspect of uh, political sovereignty, which is uh, foreign policy and war. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm curious, or I don't, I don't know, how do you um, explain, or, or how do you explain, sorry, uh, this um, this phenomenon that were only possible maybe in the only when the youth have uh, a state. had a state and, and a sovereign state. Yeah, this is uh, definitely, uh, first of all, I, uh, we by no means restrict ourselves only to the Jewish community. Mm -hmm. um, and there's there are long traditions of reflecting on all these issues. Uh, and we brought them all, all, all out. Um, the idea, the structure of, of, of Volume 4 really relates to sovereign politics and its limits. We begin with the question of land because territory is understood as part of the underpinning of, of the nation-state structure. Indeed, if you look at the, uh, it's, it's interesting that actually questions um, territory was not really examined seriously philosophically until the late 90s. Um, uh, which is fascinating when you think about it because it's such a crucial issue. Um, now, one of the interesting things is that the conceptualization, of, when you look at the history of conceptualizing territory, the most important early modern work that throws us into it is John Selden's work on the laws, on the law of territory. Selden, interestingly, is is a 17th century Hebraist, and he structures his law of territory according to Maimonides and the biblical law of the land in the book of Numbers. Now, this is fascinating because, um, because the concept of a people and the, the, the concept of the land in the Bible are crucial elements that feed into modern politics. Um, and uh, my definition of the West is those traditions that inherited Biblical structures of political theology on the one hand, mm -hmm. and Greek reflection on the political on the other. And Roman. What? And Roman. Yes. And Rome. And Rome. But but first and foremost, Greek. Mm -hmm. Now, why is this? When you look at it that way, then the crucial divide is between Judaism, Christianity, and Islam on the one hand, and China, India, Japan, on the other, in terms of the globe. I'm not, and I'm, not, I'm leaving aside the New World, what was called the New World. I'm, I'm putting that aside right now. And I think that this is very important because it, it means and it shows us that, that when thinking about the political and the history of the political, we have a number of different expressions of this tradition that are very important to think about and, and very long continuities, some of them very problematic ones. In the first, why did I mention this? Is the first a volume that was, um, that was published by Cambridge University Press on, on states and boundaries, which is the first philosophical study of territory. The opening essay is my essay where I wrote on the concept of a promised land. And this, this goes from the Bible to the kind of notions that you find in Benedict Anderson's work on imagined communities, on how we imagine territory and how crucial the biblical narrative 
of going from the wilderness to the land and mapping out the land has been crucial to the tradition, to the modern tradition of territory and conceptualizing territory because territory is not the same thing as real estate. It's not one continuum, it's a reconceptualization. So I, I, I gave this at length because I want to show you, for example, how the notions of land are crucial. Turn to another issue, which is here Michael Walzer was a crucial person in his Just and Unjust Wars, which really um, um, created the discourse of just war again um, following Vietnam. And that's really the canonical work that everyone begins with today. The first, uh, let me see this. The first important modern work on laws of wars is by Suarez and is Spanish. But where does he go back to? Besides going to earlier fathers of the church, he goes to the book of Deuteronomy and its laws of war. The laws of war in Deuteronomy are the first articulation of, of the notion of rules in war, of jus ad bellum. That's the first time we have it. The distinction between jus ad bellum and jus in bellum is suaris. That's his, one of his great contributions. But the, um, I'm, I'm bringing these points to show you that, that this tradition, when you start looking at it in a more serious fashion, and, and take the question of politics as prima facie possible, suddenly so much more opens before you and you see the continuities. Um, so the, the, these are, for example, examples, and yes, they are, they, they are full. The, the, the amounts are, are uh, as soon as we, we found the way to ask the questions and to classify, then the question just became of how much can we in good conscience leave out? Any other question? Yeah. Uh, Hi, uh, well, my name is Maria Angeles Gallego. I work here and research in Jewish studies as well, on Judeo Arabic. And uh, I would like uh, to ask you, you can uh, explain a little more what, you, what do you consider a Jewish political thinker or just a political thinker? And I was thinking that uh, that discussion happens in many other areas of Jewish studies, of course. Uh, well, I work in Judeo Arabic, and uh, we also have the question: Is that Arabic or Arabic uh, Arabic written by Jews, or is it uh, Judeo Arabic the same applies to Yiddish and many other languages? So it, it is always a question of where do you establish Jewish distinctiveness, if there is? Is it the self-perception? For instance, if I think of Judeo Arabic writers in the Middle Ages. It is not their self-perception. They would only say, I write in Arabic, nothing else. But me, as an observer, I can see elements, clear elements, that are specifically Jewish, and that uh, there is a Jewish audience for that uh, readership in this case. So it wasn't quite clear to me how did you establish boundaries for Jewish political thinkers or just political thinkers without uh, being Jewish? Well, I, I think the answer is in the functionalist notion I gave of a tradition. I don't think that there is any a priori way to, to, to create strict boundaries. There are none. Mm -hmm. It's the wrong question. Here, I'm completely Wittgensteinian. I think there is no such thing. I think they're all language games. And the question is, the, and, and they, 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 they cross over each other, they move into each other. They create headaches for us while we try to create classification. And that's exactly what they're supposed to do. There is no answer. But we do work with models. Mm -hmm. So we're looking for, in my opinion, for pragmatic and functionalist models. So that's, and when, I think when you think about it that way, you suddenly see that usually the people that we're most interested in studying were well aware of the problematics themselves. Any Jew writing in Andalusia, a work like, let's take Yudha Levi. Mm -hmm. right. Yudha Levi is completely aware of the Arabia. Mm -hmm. He knows what this is about. When he's creating his concepts of what Hebrew poetry should be, then like 
Moshe Ibn Ezra, his contemporary, or actually his older contemporary in this mm -hmm. respect, Avram Ibn Ezra, he is working out in his own work the questions of what these boundaries are. He writes the Kuzali in Arabic, or writes his poetry in Hebrew. And when he wants to write a love poem, you suddenly hear him speaking, or the speaker speaking to the woman in Spanish. Or she's answering him in Spanish. What does this mean, a polyglot like this? Someone who's working between different languages. You see, he's troubled by that. How do I articulate myself? How do I understand myself? So I think that these questions, rather than looking for tight boundaries, I think the better approach is to see how the multiple frames of discourse in action serve to enrich and restrict each other as they're happening. I think that that's the way to do rich history. Um, and that's, that, that's the way we try to do it here. So the answer is there is no answer. Um, now, I'll give you one, one radical example. Paul. I argue that Paul has to be included, Romans must be included in the chapter on election. Noam Zohar, my colleague and my chavruta of many, many years, until this very day, argued against me. He said, no, Paul's Romans is the foundational document of Christianity. It should not be viewed that way. Now, and Michael took a middle position. So we didn't decide the question of Paul until we closed, the, until we submitted the second volume. Um, at, uh, we're thinking what to do with it. Um, at one point I suggested, okay, you don't want to put Paul in, in the readings, let's put him in as an appendix to the courses. So Michael Wilson said, no, that would be putting like a yellow star, a Jewish star on Paul. We can't do that to him. So at the end I was outvoted. Two against one. I, and I still think I was right, that Paul should have been in. And, you, and for the very reasons of the criteria I spoke to you about. Why? Because in any language game, you know the boundaries only when you've passed them. How else can you know that there's a boundary? So some boundaries are conditions of meaning. But we're, we're moving them all the time. They're never solid. So, um, uh, but as I said, I was outvoted by my friends, by my colleagues, and I have to accept the rule upon myself. Thank you. The floor is still open, so. Yes, I have a, a question. I, my yeah. name is Delfina Serrano. I am from Arabic and Islamic studies. And I see here in your, uh, your in the, in the table, table of contents, contents the <laughs> question of legitimacy of non-Jewish authority. Right. And then my question is, uh, are uh, the discussions limited to whether it is a sin or whether it is bad or good to do that or to... Uh, it, I mean, it's just the discussion is just about moral and religious uh, qualifications about either the, 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 the way how the Gentile ruler rules or the kind of things the Jews living under his authority are expected to accept or, or not? Or, uh, for example, is um, the question posed whether there is a point uh, of no, uh, I mean, there is a um, uh, a point of no return, so to speak, and, mm -hmm. um, in that, uh, a point, uh, a maximum, or, a, or a, yes, a maximum uh, that renders obligatory for the Jews to emigrate or to martyr themselves. To sorry? martyr, martyr, mm -hmm. martyr. Ah, okay, yes. yes. Excellent, am, am, yeah, excellent, uh, excellent question. Excellent question, and, and I think as someone who comes from Arab studies, you, you understand the acuteness of it. What is the big problem of, of Muslims today? Is that Sharia is premised upon the distinction between Dar al-Halb 
and Dagal Islam. Mm -hmm. And therefore, Muslim immigrants are not adequately equipped to live in non-Muslim societies. There is no strong tradition of legitimizing non-Islamic rule. The condition of exile for Jews is the complete acceptance of the authority of the law and of the ruler of the non-Jewish state. In Hebrew, the term is dina de malchuta dina. The law of the kingdom is law. Din al malk din. But you can't use the word din that way in Arabic because din here doesn't mean religion. It means law. Maybe hukam. Or shalom. Right. Shal al Malak or or al Madina also because because it depends on Malchuta actually in, in means um, a kingdom. Mm -hmm. But interestingly Maimonides in his Mishnah Tova he writes Dina Melech, uh, the law of the king of Al Malk. Mm -hmm. um, now the so first of all the, the, the tradition is, is here, the, the, now this is crucial because Judaism, Rabbinic Judaism, like Islam, are law-centered religions. Something that's very, very difficult often for Christians to understand it is a law that, that is not primarily faith-based, but practice-based. Um, the, 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 the focus is, the focal point is completely different. God is mediated by the law. Now, the in this respect, the notion of dina de malchuta dina, the law of the kingdom of law, is dramatic in a legal society, and that's what enables it. That, that's what that's what enabled Jews to to um, to become part of their society to to a very important degree. Now, what are the limits? The limits, of course, depend first of all on your theory of how you understand why it is that the law of the kingdom of the king is law. Okay, so your theory of, uh, about it will also inform the, 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 the boundaries. Basically, the distinction was held the, uh, somewhere uh, with regard anything in civil and political laws under the ju jurisdiction of the king, ritual law, is retained by the community. Now, the point of breakdown is the point of persecution. That's the classic point of breakdown. Now, here, with regard to persecution, there are really two traditions. Maimonides' tradition, which is, if you're persecu persecuted, immigrate. The Northern European Ashkenazi tradition was a strong tradition is if you're persecuted, martyr. Become a martyr. If, if you don't have to reach to this limit. I mean, okay, now between, okay, that's the limit case. Persecution, I mean. Okay, between them, there's a whole range of possibilities. Look at the tradition of conversos. Look, there are many different, no, I mean, and Mahanos, there are so many different options in the middle. Uh, an accommodation and there are many many possibilities basically what we did was that the legal aspect of it we dealt with in this chapter yeah, with the question I mean, of persecution we dealt in the chapter on election yeah. in part two because wow. why there because election we dealt with also the question of commitment um, to death I mean, uh, Volume 4, Exile? In Volume 4, Exile, what we try to deal with is, is how Jews understood the condition of exile. What does it mean to be in exile? And how do you interpret exile, whether as a political concept or as a metaphysical theological concept? That, that, that was our concern there. And we put it because because messianism is such an important element in, in understanding the horizon of political thought, we had, um, we had to begin with exile because exile is, is a form of thinking about the breakdown of politics also.
any other question? I mean, just if you don't have uh, further questions, yes. there again. Uh, yeah. Okay. Javier. Yes. Well, first of all, thank you so much for coming here <coughs> to teach us some, some important things. To be with, I should say that I am in your, your volumes, your project. I think it's a long time overdue project. I think it's a, it's a superb contribution. It's a superb contribution. No question about that. But <clears throat> talking from the South, which is something that it's very much what I feel when I, I, I listen to you. I mean, though you come from the Mediterranean, when I listen to you, I feel like trying to listen to you from the South. It's very intriguing to me that feeling. <clears throat> I, I've been trying to listen to you from a musical point of view, because your converse is so coherent and well coordinated that, uh, that it seems to me it's too much what we teach in the classroom. You have given us a, a series of uh, developments in political theory. But well, in, one, in one word, I'm trying to make you a little contribution from political theory, not from Jewish studies, not from history. And I find that if I listen to you from a melodic point of view, what I hear something. But in trying to go into harmony, you come out with different treasures. So there are two many hands at least for me today here. One is very pious. It's a word that you didn't mention, which is very transcendental, as you know, in Western Europe. All you have told us is what you might listen if you attend a, um, a right course in Firestone Library, for example. But uh, then, later on, you have come out to different things your silences. For example, you never mention rhetoric. And it's really incredible that someone coming from the Mediterranean and from a Mediterranean culture it, it does not mention that word, which is crucial. And I think it's crucial to understand my monitor's approach to politics, to life, to teaching. And it's something that I have found in book that, that insistence in dialectics. But how can you be dialectic without being rhetorical? Just you go to the first line of the rhetoric, rhetoric book by Aristotle and there you have it. They are antistrophied. How can you have a chorus? You know, the Greek chorus, where there was a strophe and antistrophe. How can you have half of the chorus? How can you mutilate the chorus? By the way, the Greek tragedy ended when the course made an exodus. That's when the, the Jewish tradition starts with an exodus. Another silence for me is the idea of well, assimilation. I was expecting for that one, and it came out. But it was in the second part of your talk. You know that for the support rabbis, they talk about the silent death. Refer to the simulation of the silent death. Another silence is Philo of Alexandria. I don't know if you, you thought about seeing Alexandria and that midpoint between Greek and Latin. Why, well, I, I actually agree with Sonia. How can you make that reference to the background of political theory in the West without the idea of law? Hannah Arendt wrote beautiful pages about that. And the tragedy that's been to go to the idea of war in the Greek, in, in, in the Greek tradition, avoiding the much more advanced and peaceful idea of the uh, law. Just going to, uh, for me, one of the most important political theorists in the 20th century, I, I too think it was a political theorist, uh, Sigmund Freud. Mm? When <coughs> When he mentioned an idea 
the, the, the method of freedom of association, which is a political theory, right, uh, political rights coming, I, I think, from the French Revolution, that we put inside the inner world. That's another science, never mentioned the inner world. But going to your canon, that you, you, in the second part, you said, well, I'm not trying to canonize. Obviously, you were not, but you had to. You were very powerful in the first part. Uh, in Leviathan, I, I know you are very keen on that book, you know it very well. Hobbes mentions three times in Latin, in foreign Latin. What does it say? For is it? It's a public space. So, I think those silences for me are very rich. And came to my mind, as we say in Catalan, <laughs> came to my mind the difference between the herald and the matchmaker. At times, you sound to me, in both cases, as a master, I would say you're a real master, a herald. And in the second part, you are coming more and more towards the idea of matchmaker. You know, in Spain, we don't have a good literature. Uh, but there are two masterpieces. One is about a matchmaker, Celestina. He didn't mention the idea of mutakalim. And well, and yes, identity I was expecting for that work that came at the end, and obviously you have to it's very profound. You were at Princeton. The Princeton was Sheldon Wallin. Well, I think he lived to Princeton in the 70s. And politics as vision. With my, if I listen to you with my melodic ear, Yes, I, I hear Michael Walsh's spheres, of spheres like, like circles, they are very Greek oriented. It's the inclination to give more importance to the eye than to the ear. Obviously, that's more big than what choice in my humble view. But I, here, I think we are more fond to our common, if I may say so, common master Michael Walsh, the, the revolution of the saints. It's a fascinating book. It's much more prophetic. Well, so all these ideas, the word state, I don't think you can use the word state at the beginning of the, of the first century after the common year. Ah, it's anachronistic. It's, and the association of politics with the state, yes, and no. Hmm? And please try to think about all the list of uh, names that you've given to us. John Ross, Habermas. I spent time and again in trying to clean the minds of my students of those names. That they were good, interesting. Not to mention the inclination to the Calvinist that you share with my colleagues in Spain. You know that John Locke was a Calvinist thinker and chose. And Hobbes, he was a mortalist, was supposed to be a mortalist, a very Calvinist. So, and what about the vision from the South, which is much more peaceful? And uh, it had so many things to report. As you know, I, I, I learned very much from your politics and the so law, and I quoted it so many times that at times I felt guilty that I was writing <laughs> a glossary to your book. But uh, are you, in your book also, I, I think I, if I'm not double voice, you said something, but uh, you were saying also, mm, I'm not so sure that this was the modernization. Well, just to, I was so need to listen to you that it's why I'm becoming so lengthy in my answer. And how would you how would you see that idea of the inner world in, in the difference that it's well it's developed in a projective way in the Greek well and how it comes out in the Jewish tradition. To mention Hobbes idea that the prophetic the prophetic container of political fear is ended after Jesus Christ. There is no more need for any prophets. They were good, they did their job, which is 
sounds very much what is an idea about Judaism. But now there's no more need of, pro, of, pro, pro, for prophets, which uh, leads political theory in a very violent world. How can you do right? I'm talking in general of political theory without that. And I think it's something that Judaism in Western Europe uh, left. That's only these are the ideas. Another impromptu should be Kafka's process. For us, Kafka is a superb political theorist. Well, but it doesn't fit in your, in your <laughs> no, at the end of your, your, the kind of, of your, your, your points. Thank are, you again for being here. No, you know, your points are, are very, 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 very deep and um, and um, and are premised upon a very long dialogue between us. I feel <laughs> uh, things that I wouldn't be able to put on the table here um, so okay. easily, but I think. Um, I think you helped me understand something. Why I didn't succeed and find it so difficult finishing the third volume is because these first two volumes were written by someone very naive in many ways um, in terms of politics. Um, and the questions that you raise have to do a lot with the reasons that I moved from political thinking back into theology in a much more serious fashion. Um, um, the, the book, uh, this book, Dazzled by Beauty, which I've written only in Hebrew. Um, also, uh, many things, many things happened. Um, uh, this is a book about rhetoric and poetics in Maimonides. Um, interestingly, and some of you will know this, that the poetics uh, in, the, in the Christian tradition is put near the uh, ethics and, and politics, but in the Arab tradition it's part of the Organon. And this is crucial. Um, this is foundational to prophetic politics. Um, and I think that one of the things I discovered in moving, um, in my trying to give a reading of the Guide of the Perplexed, was appreciating more and more what you're speaking about. The great turn inwardness is done by Bahia ibn Pakuda in his Duties of the Heart, which is the first um, Sufi work written, both in Arabic and Judeo-Arabic in Andalusia. This is a, a great Sufi work. And that is the call to inwardness, which is the call that, that, that Bahia is doing, that Ibn Gabirol is calling in a Neoplatonic vision. Um, um, and of course, a lot of it has to do with my own history as uh, growing up in, as a young person in the United States, but then in Israel. Um, the, I grew up as a child in what was a heroic society, and a society that then lost its innocence. Um, that loss of innocence has been very traumatic for many Israelis, and has been the cause of tremendous hatred on the part of people who can't understand the deadlocks of our society. Um, how to write politics and do politics from there without succumbing to the despair of politics that has been the mark of the left in Europe, that has left politics. Um, how can one continue doing a project like the Jewish political tradition under these conditions? Is, um, is, is a burning question. And in many ways, instead of doing volume three, I published Leviathan. And why did I publish Leviathan in Hebrew? Because I felt that my society 
by the way, both Jewish and Palestinian, was faced with the question of how how can you say yes to politics in spite of the deep violence of human life? I think Hobbes, the profundity of Hobbes is that this question never leaves his eyes. And, um, and I thought that that was my responsibility. Um, um, but uh, these few remarks, uh, from my point, deeply personal, are, um, are a gesture to your penetrating questions and to listening to my music. Um, I'll, I'll let you know that I've also published four books of poetry in Hebrew. Um, the latest book I, I translated um, into Hebrew, um, Wordsworth's Tinter Nabi, and T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets. Um, and perhaps that's where, that's where you hear the music very, very clearly. Uh, it sometimes hides here like a good Straussian. <laughs> I'm not. Uh, there is another missing just, word. Just, the missing yeah. word here. Uh, just, just uh, let me just drop it. Yeah, I just would suggest to continue conversation in lunch uh, if you want. Me, or just to let the audience share with me the words idolatry that it never appeared in the talk. But, it was always but that's the heart of the matter. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Good uh, afternoon. Thank you very Thank you much. much. Thank you. I just would like to invite everyone to join us this lunch. If you can stay longer and so we can continue conversation while eating. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>